Uh, Mr Speaker, I always understood that in these sort of debates you'd allocate a bit of time at the front for rebuttal, but I must say I listened to that and I didn't have anything, anything at all from Mr Mallard that I could respond to because he made a whole bunch of stuff up and apart from that he didn't much, but I did enjoy at the end his, his, I did enjoy at the end his willingness to offer assistance. And that rang a bell for me, Mr Speaker, because I recall actually how good he was back in 2006 at Auckland. So perhaps he was offering a bit of assistance with diplomacy, Mr Mallard was. Because here's a few press clippings from 2006 as Mr Mallard ducked and weaved his way across Auckland trying to organise himself a Rugby World Cup. He started off diplomatically by suggesting that Auckland has no vision. That was Trevor's opening shot in the Herald, that Auckland had no vision. He said in regards to a revamped Eden Park, it was a poor second option. It showed a lack of imagination by the city. It shows a city that doesn't have a vision. And of course that went down with Auckland, according to the paper, about as easily as as Mr Mallard's Heineken moment. So moving along, what was his next step in diplomacy and working with Auckland? Well, he said once again, it shows a city that does not have a vision, but it might be what Auckland wants, he said. Clearly he'd been told off and he admitted it. Then John Armstrong wrote, Mallard plays hardball in his field of dreams. Because as we know, Trevor is a sensitive and inclusive guy. And he said he's quite happy for Aucklanders to choose whichever stadium they wanted, as long as it was the one that he planned to build, because he was always right. And then on the 23rd of November, Mr Speaker, Mr Mallard said... Uh, In fact, the newspaper pointed out that residents and businesses of Auckland City could expect big extra rates bills for years if city councillors opt for Trevor Mallard's stadium on the waterfront. Then Brian Rudman, normally a friend of the Labour Party, and certainly more recently is, said let's hope the ARC has the courage to vote no over Trevor Mallard and pointed out that Aucklanders didn't want Trevor's stadium. But he continued, Mr Speaker. He then went on and said, and got together with, I think we might recall the mayor actually, a chap called Dick Hubbard, and said, and the paper said that Trevor Mallard and Dick Hubbard can stumble about in grief and frustration, muttering that their waterfront stadium is not dead, but it is, and of course it was as dead as a duck. And then finally, Mr Speaker, the Herald finished on December the 2nd by saying Mallard's loss may be the people's gain, and so it proved, Mr Speaker. Now, that's the sort of assistance Mr Mallard would like to offer in Auckland. Then I think Auckland would tell him to just politely disappear off somewhere else, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, the the reality is New Zealand is having a tremendous time with this tournament. It is a wonderful tournament that has started extremely well, Mr Speaker. And I, for one, have enjoyed, and I don't often get to watch rugby these days, I'm not quite sure why that is, but I have enjoyed a few games that I never thought I would watch, including I was watching on TV the other night that South Africa-Wales game in Wellington, which was a fantastic game. I also saw a bit of the poignant celebrations, uh, commemorations, sorry, in New Plymouth of the, uh, of the uh, US rugby team that had to play on that day, the, the 10th anniversary of 9-11. I also saw, Mr Speaker, that energetic game at Eden Park last week. I saw, ga- uh, I saw a bit of the Scotland-Georgia game last night, only about 15 minutes. That was a dour struggle in the deep south. And the crowds, Mr Speaker, wherever you go, the crowds have been large. When Canada upset Tonga the other night in uh, in Whangarei, the crowds were large. We also, Mr Speaker, had a wonderful opening ceremony. A wonderful opening ceremony at Eden Park. And I don't know about other New Zealanders, but I always get a little bit nervous at those sort of events, the opening ceremony. How good will it be? Well, I was proud from beginning to end. It was a wonderful opening ceremony. I'd like to congratulate those who put it together. And also, Mr Speaker, there was a wonderful uh, atmosphere down the waterfront for the most part. 200,000 people, a fireworks celebration that was truly wonderful. And actually, Mr Speaker, New Zealanders are in a mood to celebrate. Apart from that crowd over there, New Zealanders are in a mood to celebrate, Mr Speaker, and actually they've had just about enough of the forensic analysis of the Labour Party as it desperately tries to lift itself off the canvas by ripping down the rest of the country. That's what they've had enough of, Mr Speaker. They've had enough of the Labour Party desperately trying to lift itself up 
and actually um, and on, on the shoulders of the rest of New Zealand who are determined to enjoy the Rugby World Cup, Mr Speaker. Now, Mr Speaker, there were a number of things that happened last Friday that we all believe shouldn't have happened, and they were in relation to two matters. The, um, the uh, handling of the crowds down at the waterfront and also the transport issues that arose during the evening in, uh, in Auckland and nobody was happy with those outcomes, Mr Speaker. And on Tuesday morning, I met with the Mayor and also with Auckland Transport in Auckland, and we had a very good discussion. And yesterday afternoon, the Auckland Council published the reviews of those events, Mr Speaker, and they made a number of comments. And in relation, under the letterhead of AT, which is the Auckland Tourism Events and Economic Development, uh, uh, Economic Development uh, Organisation, they noted a number of things that they were unhappy with in terms of their own organisation that needed to be sorted, and those were the crowd management on Key Street, uh, insufficient provision of services, uh, the main screen gantry being too close to the ferry building and some technical failure of the big screens. Now, they have put their hand up, Mr Speaker, and they have said that they will work with the Minister of the Rugby World Cup and fix those issues, and they have agreed that they will. In relation to transport, Mr Speaker, in relation to transport, there was no doubt that the numbers uh, that tackled the, um, uh, the, the, the tackled the public transport in Auckland last Friday night were much larger than anybody expected, and there were a number of issues. And as a result, Auckland Transport has stood up and said they will make some changes for this weekend, and I support those changes, Mr Speaker. They are going to change uh, the number of uh, – arrange a much larger capacity between Britomart and Eden Park with 100 additional buses. They're going to offer additional security. Now 100 staff uh, at, at Britomart, whereas previously they had 60. They're increasing their security presence across the network. They're placing security staff in all, pack in all carriages and they're limiting loadings to 10 per cent below the maximum. And they're improving the number of announcements on the trains. And I think those are good moves. And, Mr Speaker, I'm confident that Auckland Transport has taken on uh, the responsibility and the lessons from last weekend, and they will act on those this weekend. And they will act on... Well, that's a very interesting discussion point. Because let's look, then, Mr Speaker, at some of Labor's attacks um, on the government on this. Because some of them are very shameless political attacks. Because so I think it's really important that you make the, always look not at what they say, but what they do. So there's a few members on that side of the House, Greens and Labor members, who are suggesting that the network should have been electrified by now, and perhaps that was the government's fault. Well, Mr Speaker, in Budget 2007, the then government, can't remember which side of the House they came from, said that they would set up electrification by charging Auckland as a 10 cent a litre regional fuel tax. And then the question was, when will it be done? And the actual quote from, uh, from uh, Michael Cullen and Annette King was, the aim is to have electrification completed by 2013. Oh, but wasn't the Rugby World Cup due in 2011? Oh, the government investigated the possibility of having electric trains up and running for the Rugby World Cup in 2011, but this would be too risky and costly. Ah. Oh in terms of sourcing the material. This is in 17th of May 2007. We'd already had the Rugby World Cup for a while then, and now their MPs have the shamelessness to get up in this House and suggest that the government should have sorted out the electrification in time for the Rugby World Cup. They also suggest that, that Ms Ardern, who lives somewhere in Auckland, or does she live in the Waikato, has suggested that somehow the CBD rail link should have been built. The CBD rail link should have been built for the Rugby World Cup. Well, excuse me, but the nine years of government of the previous Labor government would have been needed and some to do that, Mr Speaker. And then, of course, we have Mr Twifford and his issues, Mr Speaker, who's blaming the issues of Auckland on the council organisations and saying that's somehow the government's fault, Mr Speaker. Well. Council-controlled organisations have been around for a wee while now, Mr Speaker, and the reality is, in the nine years of government, Labor were quite happy to have council-controlled organisations. They were quite comfortable with those. They now believe they should be cancelled. Another shameless political attack, and for Mr Twifford's benefit, Auckland Transport is ARTA enlarged. 
And ARTA was the organisation that was order, there at the time. Point of order has been called by Dr Russell Norman. Point of order. Thank you, Mr Speaker. It is, um, Mr Speaker, it is common courtesy in this House to pronounce people's names correctly. Mr Twyford's name is pronounced Mr Twyford and the Minister knows that. I've, it is correct. We should try to pronounce other members' names correctly. Sometimes we're less good at doing it than, than we'd like to be, though. I mean, all of us make mistakes now and then. But uh, we should... No. Point of order, the Honourable Trevor Mallard. Uh, Mr Speaker, I just don't accept that that was a mistake. The Minister has oh, done no, it order. repeatedly order. and deliberately. Order. No, order. Order. We all make mistakes. I've repeatedly made mistakes on members' names, which I, I regret. I've, I can think of uh, a couple of members whose names I've mispronounced repeatedly, and I regret that. But I trust the Minister will now use the correct pronunciation. Point of order, the Honourable Trevor Mallard. Uh, Mr Speaker... Um, I agree with you, and we now trust that he will use uh, proper pronunciation, Mr Speaker, but I don't think anyone in the House other than you accepts that it was a mistake. He did it deliberately. He laughed as he did it, Mr Speaker, as he has done on a number of occasions. If Mr Twyford was a Maori member, sir, that member would have been admonished a long time ago. Believe me, I've heard uh, members in this House mispronounce Maori members' names appallingly badly too. And I just ask the Minister, please, to... Uh, show members respect by trying to pronounce their names correctly. Uh, and, and sorry, sorry, Mr Speaker, it's just that I've heard it so often. Uh, I've, I've said a certain way in this House, I've, I, I've assumed that it was the same, but I won't anymore. So anyway, Mr Twyford. Point of order. Mr Twyford. Order, point of order has been called. The Honourable Rick Bain. It's a, It is not acceptable for a member to comment on a decision of the chair. And that's what the member was doing. He was relitigating the matter and trying to justify uh, his mistake. The member has withdrawn and corrected, should just leave it and move on. And by saying that it's been a common mistake in this House and so on, is belittling your decision and is belittling uh, Phil Twyford, who, he's na who he mispronounced his name badly and deliberately, in my opinion. I'm sure the Honourable Member, if I thought he was belittling my decision, I would have pulled him up immediately, but I don't think he was. Uh, we can get too sensitive over these things. You know, I've allowed language to be used in the House in the last 20 minutes that perhaps hasn't previously been used in the House. I don't believe we should get too sensitive. This is a robust place. But I would ask the Minister, please, to try to pronounce members' names correctly. Honourable Stephen Joyce. So anyway, uh, Mr Speaker, so Mr Twyford wants the council-controlled organisations. He reckons that's the reason that it, was, that it all went wrong, according to him, was that there was council organisations rather than the council running the show. Well, with the greatest respect, Mr Twyford, the reality is that the councillor with the most skin in the game in terms of Auckland Transport over the last several years was Mike Lee. And actually, I don't know that I'd want Mike any closer to it. As it is, he's on the board of Auckland Transport. If he got any closer, he'd have his nose right up to the engines. And we actually don't need that to occur, Mr Speaker, to get a better result. The reality is, it does not take elected people, as much as we are all elected people and like to think we're pretty good at things, it does not take elected people to run airlines or run railways or run, or run bus companies or run freight companies. It takes operators to do that, Mr Speaker. And Auckland Transport is capable of doing it, Mr Speaker. They, and to be fair to them, there was much larger than expected numbers last Friday. Now, Mr Twyford and his dear friend Trevor, his, his dear friend Trevor somehow say that the uh, government was warned, the sensitive one, was warned uh, some time ago about the, um, about the, uh, the issues with order, transport I, and all. I, the order, I, I think I can anticipate the... Members in this House, should, and when referring to other members, should use their correct names, not just their first names, their correct names. And I'd ask the Minister please to do that. Uh, this is twice now he's been pulled up for mispronouncing or not using members' names correctly. I don't want to do it for a third time. The Honourable Stephen well, Joyce. Well, sorry, Point of order, the Honourable Trevor. Well, I, I, I mean, I had another one. Uh, that was a description. Uh, I wouldn't have interrupted the member's speech with the description of me as sensitive, sir. I think we all know it's more... No, 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 order. <laughs> That's not a point of order. The Honourable Stephen Joyce. Uh, yes, yes, Mr Speaker, I stand corrected, of course, on that matter. And the point being, Mr Speaker, is that the, uh, the, the ARTA report referred to by Mr Twyford and Mr Mallard, the ARTA report actually was addressed by Auckland Transport and actually by continuing to harp on about they are criticising Auckland Transport for not addressing that report. They addressed and put in place all the matters that were raised in that report 
They dealt with that report, Mr Speaker, and they had their preparations peer reviewed. So the challenge for that organisation was that the numbers greatly exceeded what they expected. There were some operational issues between themselves and their operator, which they are working on, and as we know, there's an inquiry underway on that, Mr Speaker, uh, and they are determined to take action to fix those issues, Mr Speaker. And I think that's what we can ask of them, and as Transport Minister, that is what I will require of them, and that is their responsibility. But Mr Speaker, as I say, the opposition's history in these matters is frankly laughable when they seek to criticise the government. Their, their arguments and their negativity, I think, is actually 